Sonic Mania Plus adds even more to the already stellar package that was 2017 Sonic Mania, which I previously stated was the best Sonic game in over 20 years, and my second favourite Sonic game of all time. I still stand by that, my opinion has not drastically changed since that original video. Unfortunately, while Plus does add some great new content and fix upon the core foundation of the game in areas that I felt really needed it, it could have done so much more. I wasn't expecting Plus to suddenly turn the game into a fully original Sonic 3 & Knuckles sequel with all new zones, bosses, music, and character sprites or anything ridiculous like that, because then it would have been a completely different game. But as an update, and a chance to build upon the simple game mechanics and features, along with responding to fan criticism, Plus really could have turned Sonic Mania into a near-flawless game, outside of its reuse of old content from the classic series. The returning zones are probably still my biggest issue with the core game, preventing it from truly standing on its own and feeling cohesive. If I may spoil my supposed agenda in this video, it's one of overwhelming praise sprinkled with disappointment, sometimes in the most minute of details. Much like my original Mania critique, I am overall extremely happy with my purchase, uh, multiple purchases, of Sonic Mania and Mania Plus, and a Steam gift copy of the Encore DLC from JDHD99, thanks again by the way. It's only through my love of the Sonic franchise, and especially my high praise of games like Sonic 2 and 3, that I can find further nuanced faults and room for improvement in this final build of Sonic Mania. I don't want it to sound like I have more bad things to say about this game than the good, because I still think Mania is a killer game. It should also be understood that the only solution to many of my issues is further development time, which is up to Sega and not the core development team. I am 95% certain that most of my critiques were problems known to the Mania developers during production, but they simply did not have the time to truly achieve their vision. My intention is for this video, and others like it, to act as a potential source of information that can be useful in preventing any of these errors from occurring again in the next eventual Classic Sonic game. While I understand that may come across as a little self-righteous and arrogant, I simply want to have my thoughts put out there and to, at the very least, resonate in the minds of fans and generate some meaningful discussion. And to be fair, I do know that at least one member of the Mania dev team watched my original critique, so I have that to be all proud and smug about at the very least. Yeah, look at me, nerds, ain't I cool? This critique is designed to focus entirely on the elements exclusive to Plus, so I'll be looking first at the free side of the update, major and minor game changes, along with the paid content, our two new playable characters, and Encore Mode. I would highly recommend you watch my original critique if you haven't already, especially if you want to hear my thoughts on the game's story, presentation, zones and bosses in reasonably thorough detail. I'd like to stress once more that I love Sonic Mania. I really, truly do. I can recommend this game to just about anyone with an interest in platformers, and with the new features of Plus, the game is even better than before. You might even like this game more than Sonic 3 & Knuckles due to its more modern design and accessibility, not to mention portability on Switch. But if you're like me and have pretty high expectations of classic Sonic games when it comes to cohesion, replayability, and other minor elements, then you may find yourself slightly disappointed. Slightly being the key word. Don't let this critique somehow discourage you from supporting this game and the incredible team behind it. Quick disclaimer, there are a handful of minor visual and audio mods that I'm running over the game, just like in my original critique. Sonic is his proper shade of blue, there are star posts instead of lamp posts, Sonic 3 sound effects, and max control is enabled so Sonic has all of his moves. With that out of the way, let's start getting far too in-depth on 2018's Sonic Mania Plus. <laughs> If there's one thing that the added features of Mania Plus proved to me, it's that Mania was indeed a bit rushed at the end of development. This should come to absolutely no surprise from a longtime Sonic fan, but I felt it was worth mentioning. The same can be said for the new features in Mania Plus, a lot of it can feel unfinished or like it's only a small solution to a larger problem. An element of Sonic Mania that was so obviously lacking were the zone transitions. Some had them, others didn't. A chunk of them were pretty cool too, while others were just boring characters get teleported to new level transitions. On paper, adding these new transitions in was a fantastic idea, and pretty high priority if you ask me. But unfortunately, I don't really like that many of these new ones. 
The first new one, the glider down from Flying Battery and into Press Garden, is really good. It makes the world feel a little bit more connected, and there's also a cute little callback to Sonic 2 on Game Gear and Master System, while reminding me of the original Flying Battery end transition where Sonic jumped out at the end of the ship. The transition from Stardust Speedway to Hydro City is literally the same one from Press Garden. Eggman warps you with the Phantom Ruby. I just really don't like these. They feel like such cop-outs, especially with this one, since Sonic still just drops out of the top of the screen without any kind of introductory animation or sound to conclude the warp transition as seen in the start of Chemical Plant, for example. The original Hydro City opening makes a lot more sense when the previous zone ends with the cool dropping transition. Knuckles flips the switch to break the bridge and sends Sonic dropping down into the water world below. Perfect! But the way it's done here in Mania just doesn't feel right, and it's still a product of the game's core lack of cohesion, with all of these zones taking place across South Side Island, West Side Island, Little Planet, and Angel Island, and the game needing to make excuses to get these characters from place to place. To reiterate, I did not expect this issue to be completely fixed in Mania Plus, since the zones are obviously going to be the same, but I was hoping to see their place in the game feel a little bit more thoughtful. The worst of these new transitions is probably at the end of Hydro City, with this wall bursting open and the characters running through, taking us to the start of Mirage Saloon with no form of introductory animation whatsoever. Apparently this tunnel was a direct passage to the tornado and lets Knuckles still appear out of nowhere. If you're playing the new Encore mode, you'll also just start standing on the ground of the new Act 1 with no introduction at all. I don't think I really need to explain why this one feels shockingly lacking. The new Oil Ocean to Lava Reef transition is basically all I'm asking for. It feels appropriate within the game's cartoony context while maintaining geography and offering a neat visual to stimulate the player and encourage them to keep playing. This new transition from Lava Reef to Metallic Madness on the other hand is pretty bad. I mean, I really like how the platform starts slowly rising towards Little Planet during the boss with Heavy Rider, but I don't like how Sonic just looking at the planet in the distance is enough to justify him suddenly being there in the next zone. The exact same can be said for Metallic Madness to Titanic Monarch. We get a great look at the menacing figure in the background, that still doesn't mean anything in the game's story at all, and then we're just there in the next zone without a proper animation. At least Tails gets scared by the lightning though. So, since this was an element that myself and many fans were annoyed to see was lacking in lots of Mania zones, I am truly glad to see these new transitions, but some of them do really suck. My assumption is that this will not be a problem again provided a Mania sequel is comprised entirely of new zones that take place along one clear, cohesive adventure and not a scattered selection of old and new stages. Outside of these new zone transitions, some of Mania's bosses receive some substantial tweaks, and in the case of Metal Sonic, a complete redesign for his final phase. Going in zone order, I want to mention that the mini-boss of Studiopolis is still really long and boring, and the Spider-Mech boss for Flying Battery is just as buggy as ever. Press Garden's mini-boss got one small change, with the player's perspective being forced upwards at the start to show that the boss is weak to specific boxes. A good change, since it was easy to miss it originally. But the star of the show here really is the new Metal Sonic fight at Stardust Speedway, halfway through the game. I mentioned in my original critique that with this being the middle point, we should probably have some kind of more meaningful climactic conflict here between Sonic and Metal. So I suppose this may have been the Mania's team attempt to address that, along with fixing up small problems while they were at it? The smaller Silver Sonics in the middle phase now explode into small energy blasts when being destroyed, which can harm Metal Sonic. This is mostly for the first time players who didn't realize they're meant to spin dash into them while they're rolling, but that's been improved as well, with Metal Sonic taking about half the amount of hits he used to before the fight advances to the next phase. Nice, these are great changes so far. It's this final segment though that's received a massive change. For one, a mid-boss checkpoint, which I suppose streamlines the fight a little more considering the major changes to this final phase. In the original fight, Metal Sonic would chase the player down with a big spiked wall, and I wasn't really a big fan of this. I suppose the Mania team wasn't either, and decided to shake things up by bringing back Metal Sonic Kai from Knuckles Chaotix, thanks to the Phantom Ruby. This new phase ends up functioning as a reskin of the Great Eggman Robo second phase from Death Egg and Sonic 3 and Knuckles, with a giant robot chasing down the player and firing a variety of projectiles from the left side of the screen. Unfortunately, I think the Death Egg fight was far better designed, since this new Metal Sonic boss can feel quite unintentionally difficult. His spiked hands pivot up and down, blocking access to the weak spot, but one little bit of knockback will send you behind the body and you're essentially doomed from that point. 
The collapsing floor is probably a bit too wide, especially when compared to the death egg fight, which had a bit of a smaller room for error. Not only that, but the weak spot was suspended directly above this bottomless pit, which made the boss focused more on hitting the weak spot and bouncing back to the stable ground, rather than worrying about getting stuck and dying instantly. I think that in a thematic sense, this new phase does improve the boss's impact, even though I'm not a huge fan of Metal Sonic transforming into a monster, but if we're looking at it purely for gameplay, this new phase suffers from some pretty significant oversights. Mighty's immunity to spikes while curled in a ball can actually make this fight much harder, since if he gets close to Metal's hands, he'll spring backwards and fall into the pit below. Despite the updated scope of this battle, it still ends a little anticlimactically, and only slightly improves the impact of this moment since Metal Sonic is not remotely relevant to Mania's narrative. That's the most significant change to the bosses in Mania Plus, but the Hydro City boss got a slight upgrade in terms of animations between phases, and the standard final boss with the Phantom Egg and Titanic Monarch has undergone some under the hood changes. The order that the electric coils break in has been inverted, as now the top coils break before the lower ones, making it much harder to keep hitting Eggman even in the final phases of the fight. So I feel that's an improvement in terms of preserving the boss's challenge so it isn't so easily steamrolled. Another tweak is that it seems the hands spawn far more often, likely forcing the player to fight all of the hard-boiled heavy rematches before the boss is over. To be fair, it isn't really a hard rule, as I used my super form to blast through the boss and was only made to fight Heavy Gunner, the first rematch, and skip the other three. I think this is mostly a big improvement, since it helps to make the hardboiled heavies feel a bit more memorable for the player. While it does at least make their rematch appearances far more prominent, since it's unlikely you'll just be able to skip them, I still maintain my original criticism that these are not true fights at all. At no point do you need to actually defeat the Heavy in each of these rematches. You just survive their attacks and get warped back to Eggman without any kind of conclusion to the characters of the Heavies. Overall, these significant game changes are welcome, but some of them still feel quite undercooked. Phantom Egg felt like a boss that really could have used some further tune-ups, and the fact that nothing was affected for the Spider-Mobile in Flying Battery is quite baffling to me, since that boss still feels broken in terms of physics and collision. I feel that I should mention that all of my complaints with the game's narrative from the original video are still relevant here. Angel Island's in the ocean for some reason, Eggman's goal is really vague, the hardboiled heavies lack any kind of impact, all of that stuff. While I wasn't expecting drastic cutscene changes or additions in Mania Plus, I was really hoping that some of these elements would feel a bit more fleshed out. Again, I think that the root of a lot of these issues is the usage of old zones, preventing the team from starting fresh in terms of designing their narrative conflict and settings. The bulk of my issues with Sonic Mania was situated in this category, minor details that I wish had been improved with further development time. Mania Plus has thankfully addressed quite a few of these issues brought up by myself and other fans, but much like most of the changes here, I don't think all these were very good ones. First, let me go over all of the presentation changes. Supersonic sprites have thankfully received a huge upgrade, providing him with more unique animations and less of normal Sonic painted yellow. Not all of his poses have been fixed, but at least most of them have been, and that's far better than what we had in the original game release. There are also lots of smaller things, such as Tails getting a unique animation at the start of Chemical Plant, although it isn't the same one found in the original game files. There's a new animation for hanging off the bungee cords in Stardust Speedway, which is really neat. All of the characters will look left or right while inside of the icebox or press garden as originally intended, and the main menu interface has gotten a major change to streamline things a bit more. These are all little charming changes that help to add even more character to the game, which in my opinion is pretty crucial for a Sonic game. Sonic's all about personality, in its characters, worlds, enemies, music, and if the game calls for it, voice acting. One aspect I will always commend Mania on is its charm, but I do think the game's overall atmosphere surrounding more important moments of tension, such as the already mentioned Metal Sonic boss and the final boss, could really do with big improvements. Aside from the changes in presentation, there are a few alterations to the mechanics and options that have been updated as well. When starting a new save, you can turn off the 10 minute time limit per act, which, to be honest, should probably have just been off by default. I can only think of one or two times I ever got a time over in Mania, and it was probably when I was first playing the game and trying to find all the special stage entrances, but this is really something that didn't need to exist in the first place, especially with how huge the zones are. This is a classic series staple that I would not want to see sticking around. 
Thankfully, the devs also addressed one of my issues by adding in an option for max control without needing to mod the game. This means when I'm playing Mania on Switch, I can still enable the combination of all of Sonic's movesets, the Drop Dash, the Insta Shield, and the Super Peel Out in the vanilla game. Unfortunately, it can only be enabled via no save mode and through a cheat code that you can't exactly stumble upon without googling it first. This is honestly pretty disappointing. I don't understand why they can't just let you run all of Sonic's moves at once, especially since the Insta Shield really helps to set him apart for the higher skilled players. Not to mention it was pretty nerfed in Mania anyway. There are also cheat codes for disabling the Superform music and enabling Superforms to fly in regular stages akin to the Egg Reverie final boss. These are great options, but again, I think the fact that they're hidden away behind no save mode and cheat codes really holds them back. Now, they did allow the use of the unlockable individual modes inside of save files, such as the Ann Knuckles toggle and the different Sonic movesets, but just not a combination of all of them together. These were previously locked to no save mode as well, so it's better than nothing at all, but I still think max control would be a fantastic option to be more easily accessible within save files. Oh, and when you complete a run, you get a nice little end screen displaying all of your times for each zone, and a total time at the bottom as well. This is a super nice little feature, and very reminiscent of Sonic 2's level select and options menu. And that's about it for the smaller changes, but I'm sure there are heaps of tiny, hard to notice alterations across the board that fix little bugs and other problems. I like a lot of these small tweaks, but as always, I still feel there's lots of room for improvement into making this a near perfect game, at least in terms of options to enhance replayability and player choice. Turning to the other side of Mania Plus, the game's paid content features two characters who I thought had been lost to the sands of time, Mighty the Armadillo and Ray the Flying Squirrel. I've always liked Mighty's design and characterization a lot more than Ray, but my opinion of them in terms of gameplay has opened my eyes for both of them. These new characters can be accessed in Mania mode, where they run through the same events as a Tails playthrough, essentially the same as Sonic's run, but without the exclusive Superform final boss while their real utilization is in the new Encore mode, where they're officially introduced into a playthrough that factors in their abilities. But I'll touch on that more once I detail everything about these two new guys. Mighty is all about being strong and hardened, literally. Similar to Knuckles, he possesses great physical strength, but it's his armored shell that really personifies him. By pressing the jump button again in the air, Mighty performs a hammer drop, slamming him downwards and destroying badniks and item boxes in a small radius outside of his immediate body. This effect can also knock item boxes from trees and allow him to drill right through blocked vertical pipe entrances that normally require a jump to break through. He can also bypass enemy defenses, such as the bumper shields on top of these bumpalo badniks in Mirage Saloon. This is a fun offensive ability, but it's Mighty's passive defensive shell that really sets him apart. Just by jumping and curling into a ball, Mighty is immune to most small projectile attacks, and can bounce off spikes without a care in the world. While this can be a bit annoying when trying to perform a specific strategy against an area or enemy with spikes, like the Metal Sonic fight I mentioned earlier, it basically makes Mighty the easy mode with how universally useful his defensive skills are. All it takes is for Mighty to be in a ball, which is as easy as pressing down on the D-pad, for Mighty to avoid a large chunk of dangerous hazards. To be completely honest, I'm not sure on how much of an effect this has on the game's overall difficulty, since I find Sonic Mania to be quite easy as is, especially after so many playthroughs. The only time I ever die in Mania is via crushing hazards, or maybe just a bit of recklessness in a boss fight, but Mighty's abilities only prevent him from dying with zero rings, which is never an issue for me personally. I'm not trying to be arrogant and brag about how great I am in a Sonic the Hedgehog game, but I do want to make it clear that I can't truly comment on how these changes affect the game's difficulty from my own perspective. In terms of Mighty's role as the easy mode character, I feel that Tails or Ray suit that a bit more in terms of their personality and design, and especially with Tails' simple flight ability that can save players from difficult platforming sections. Mighty, as a character, looks like he'd fulfill a role more akin to Knuckles in Sonic 3, offering an alternate campaign with more challenge, but this is really a minor detail and isn't so much a criticism of mine, just an observation. It seems odd to recommend to someone unfamiliar with the game, yeah, play that mighty guy, he's the easy mode, but it really doesn't matter too much. When it comes to Mania mode, it does feel like Mighty's abilities aren't too fitting with the core level design or bosses, outside of his obvious defensive capabilities. 
The zones were clearly designed for Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles, and while Mighty kind of fulfills a Sonic-like experience, fitting for him beginning as a Sonic stand-in for Knuckles' Chaotix, his hammer drop breaking vertical chunks of walls doesn't really offer any exclusive pathways or major advantages for Mania Mode. This is part of the problem with add-on post-launch content like this, but at least he's fun to play regardless, and has fantastic animations that build upon his look from Sega Sonic and Chaotix, without just looking like a Sonic recolor. Just the fact that Mighty's back in the mainstream again, without being stuck in comic books, wanted posters, and spin-offs from the 90s is rather incredible. I hope he sticks around for good. And to just digress really briefly, I had to play a bit of Knuckles Chaotix for the first time during the production of this video so that I could get some context on Mighty, along with recording the footage that you're seeing now. And there's a big reason I'd never played it before. It's complete shit. Unlike Mighty's focus on strength and defense, Ray is all about mobility and vulnerability. This feels in line with his childish personality, wanting to glide through the air and explore, while still being a relatively defenseless youth. Essentially stealing the cape feather from Super Mario World, Ray's key ability is this amazingly fun glide, where he dives downwards to build speed and shoots back upwards, while further increasing his horizontal speed. This move is just the best, and if it weren't for its relative difficulty to use correctly, along with Ray's vulnerability and lack of literally any other moves besides the spin dash, I'd say it was broken. You can cheese through entire acts with this thing, not to mention cleverly reach areas above you that would be otherwise impossible if you time the glide just right. While certain areas may be easy to access with Tails Flight or Knuckles Gliding and Climbing, Ray combines these abilities together and inherits the advantages of both, with the downside of this ability simply being more difficult to use all around. If we were to present the motion of these characters as graphs, they'd probably look something like this. Tails has the ability to fly vertically, albeit not very quickly, and he works best when traveling in a sort of rainbow arc, achieving altitude across a horizontal distance, and gaining horizontal speed. It is possible to reach insane vertical speeds if Tails bounces off a bumper while flying, or if the player combines horizontal momentum with a sloped incline jump and begins flying, but these are slightly more situational elements to his movement that can't always be utilized, since they rely on specific level design. Knuckles is best for traveling really far horizontal distances, getting faster the further he goes, but only at a slight downwards diagonal trajectory. He can climb directly upward, but that's it. Completely vertical, directly above him, and quite slowly. The idea with Knuckles is to combine his climbing and gliding together across different wall surfaces in order to reach higher areas, but it's rather slow. Ray's movement is a combination of the two, traveling downwards in a diagonal arc while zigzagging back upwards again, kind of achieving a repeated rainbow arc of Tails Flight but each time he dives, the arc gets wider, with his speed increasing dramatically. This means he's got Tails' easy access to vertical movement at a far greater speed, and Knuckles' ability to traverse huge horizontal distances without getting tired. Ray can, with the right timing and knowledge of the level design, easily reach the heights of stages far easier and faster than Tails or Knuckles ever could, but he can also reach tremendous horizontal speeds with far more control than either of those two as well. While Tails does keep getting faster when flying in one direction, he's going to run out of stamina eventually. Knuckles keeps getting faster while gliding as well, and doesn't have any kind of stamina limit, but he is going to hit the ground at some point due to his downwards arc. Ray, on the other hand, he can just keep going, and going, and going, but it takes some serious skill. Speedrunners can pull off some utterly insane stuff with Ray's movement options, and it's exactly why I love playing as him. The only thing I kind of wish was changed is that once you stop gliding, you can't reactivate it until you touch the ground and jump again, even after bouncing off an enemy or item box. I think that could have made for a bit of extra strategy while gliding, knowing when to stop gliding and return to ball form so you can badnik bounce and keep the speed going, then glide again. But if I had to guess, this may have been tested and was found to be far too broken, so that extra ability was removed. And if that's the case, then that's fair, but Ray is already a character with a really high skill ceiling, and a bit of a learning curve for newer players anyway, so I don't know how much this change would have really affected the core experience for most players. It's also worth mentioning that both Mighty and Ray have super forms upon collecting all seven Chaos Emeralds. And they're super lame. They're just basic glowy versions of the same character sprites, but to be fair, I don't really know what I was expecting. 
I do sort of like the fan mods that give Mighty a blue shell for his super form. That looks pretty cool. But I guess Sonic Team really love to maintain that Sonic, and I guess Shadow and Silver too, are the only characters allowed to have cool super forms. I'm also going to take this opportunity to complain about Ray's sprite. Why is he so huge? I mean, look, his animations are great, there's tons of personality and all of that, and he's very cute, but in terms of scale, he is way too big against the other characters. It's clearly visible in Mania Adventures, the amazing animated series that tied in with Plus's release, that Ray is shorter than all of the other characters. Maybe they ran into hitbox issues with him being too small and easily avoiding attacks and things, but his upright standing and running sprites just look too big. Even his ball form looks too big, but maybe my eyes are messing with me on that one. He looks just fine in terms of scale for his gliding sprites and other secondary animations, but it's those main sprites that just look off. It's not just me, right? Like, I'm not the only one who thinks Ray's sprite looks too big? Someone please tell me I'm not insane. Outside of those little nitpicks, I really do love playing as Mighty and Ray in Mania Plus. To reiterate, Mighty is my preferred character out of the two, but Ray is more fun to play as since I can explore the zones in a whole new way. Mighty's hammer drop ability doesn't offer any kind of new pathways or shortcuts in the traditional Mania mode playthrough, and while Ray doesn't have exclusive routes to my knowledge either, I find it just as satisfying to access the higher path designed for Tails and Knuckles with Ray's gliding instead. It feels kind of like sequence breaking in Super Metroid, where it almost feels wrong, like you're breaking the game. But at the same time, it's so insanely fun to get creative with the powerful movement tools you're given. I really, truly want Mighty and Ray to stick around, at least in the classic series, for as long as possible. But I do think we really need a playable classic Amy, perhaps in the style of Sonic Advance, for whenever we get another classic game from the Mania devs. Okay, so I've covered just about everything in Mania Plus outside of the game's new Encore mode, advertised as, and I quote, a new take on familiar zones, and pushed as a remix of the original game's stages in some way or another. I was never expecting too much with this Encore mode, mainly since I just saw it as a simple little extra way to play the game, but the game itself kind of sets it up as being bigger than it really is. Let me explain since that's a bit of a wonky sentence. Encore mode features, in some fashion at least, an original narrative. If you've seen my Mania critique, you already know that I have many problems with Sonic Mania's story. In fact, I'd say it's probably the game's biggest fault, since it's caused by so many different elements, including the use of old zones. Somehow, I think Encore mode actually makes Mania's story worse than the original game, and I didn't really think that was so easy. Things get complicated from the outset. Classic Sonic warps back from the end of Sonic Forces, and already things are tricky since the animated Mania Adventures series features the exact same introduction, yet the story is completely different after this point. I can only assume that one or the other is canon, and if I had to guess, I'd say that the game gets priority over the short YouTube series, but considering the insane amount of views on those videos, I kind of feel it should be the other way around. We've only just started and already I'm confused with Encore Mode's story. Anyway, we start by going through this amazing recreation of Angel Island Act 1 from Sonic 3 that honestly nearly had me tearing up when I first played it. Yes, I am a big baby, and yes, I love Sonic 3 a lot, thank you very much. Can't wait to be called a nostalgia blind classic Sonic fanboy when I was born in 1998 and grew up with the 3D games. Wow, I've been reduced. What a surprise. While this version of Angel Island is great, it also isn't really a full level, and is kind of just a tease. Some vital elements are missing, such as the spring in the palm tree, and the hidden special stage ring, since this is meant more as an introductory segment to bring you to Encore Mode's main hook. But still, I wish this was a full zone, even just so I could marvel at the sprite work and music. At the end of this short section, Sonic comes across a combi capsule containing Mighty and Ray. Also, it looks like Angel Island is still in the ocean, which still doesn't make sense. The player is given a brief choice here, as we're introduced to Encore Mode's unique partner system. More on that in a moment. Whoever you didn't choose is revealed to be Heavy Magician, who races off to revive the defeated hardballed heavies with the power of the Phantom Ruby. We're given another one of those vague warp transitions and taken right back to the start of Green Hill, and now the game is basically the exact same as Mania Mode up until the very, very end. There's no super form final boss, let alone an exclusive final boss at all, and instead the game ends with Eggman getting shoved into a Phantom Ruby black hole by all five characters in their super forms and a harsh cut to credits. Talk about underwhelming, not to mention confusing. There's a cute little post credit scene with all the characters relaxing in Mirage Saloon, only for Heavy King to appear from nowhere. 
considering he wasn't dealt with in Encore mode as Egg Reverie wasn't a thing. So, I really can't tell what's going on in this story. In some ways, it seems like the Phantom Ruby rewound time and started everything back from the beginning, resetting the events of the original Mania? Or is this just the characters doing the same adventure again? It's hard to tell since it's normally implied that the Phantom Ruby warps the characters through space, not time, but even then it's still vague with zones like Stardust Speedway having time travel elements within them. The ending is where I really get confused as to what is canon, since I feel like tossing Eggman into the rift was some kind of potential sequel bait, but I really can't tell. As I said, this just makes Mania's narrative even more confusing than it already was, which is a real shame. I suppose it's just what happens when you try to create a remixed game mode of an existing, released game and then justify it in-universe. So with all the story nonsense done, let's discuss the main hooks of Encore mode in terms of gameplay. There are three main things that set this mode apart. 1. The partner system and live system. 2. The level design changes and palette swaps. And 3. The new special stages. Taking inspiration from the dreadful Knuckles Chaotix, Mania Plus lets you freely switch between two characters at once, with all five characters acting as your pool of available lives. This means you only really have five lives total, and when you die as one character, you instantly switch to the next one in your list. In some ways, this makes Encore Mode the hard mode, as you'll only ever have five chances to complete a boss. But in my experience, it's actually been easier, since you respawn immediately at the same spot you died at, without respawning all the way back at a checkpoint. As someone who doesn't find Mania very difficult as is, the partner mechanic doesn't really change things up too much in terms of difficulty for me. You're able to freely toggle between the two active characters on screen whenever you like, provided you're standing on solid ground, but if you want to use the other characters in your list, you'll need to use the various item boxes scattered throughout the zones that switch your roster around. One of these shuffles the roster randomly, assigning you two random characters out of your available ones, while another will move you onto the next character in the order listed at the bottom left of the screen. Possibly the best thing about the new character switching is that we now have a proper bonus stage. That's right, one of my biggest complaints about Mania has now been addressed. Blue Sphere still exists in Mania mode if you haven't completed all of them, which is kind of lame if it's your first playthrough and you want to access the bonus stage instead, but now you can access a true bonus stage for items like rings and elemental shields from within checkpoints, just like in Sonic 3. Now, I say all of this, but it still isn't perfect. It's a pretty janky pinball table that only lets you get two chances of rewards before forcing you to reach higher up the table to try again. And it's just the one bonus stage, while Sonic 3 had, well, three. While it was certainly designed for Encore mode, as you can use the combi catcher to grab back characters that you've lost, it still works well enough for standard Mania mode playthroughs if you want to grab some rings or an elemental shield before a boss fight. And I'm just very happy to see them implement a bonus stage at all in the first place. With that out of the way, let's look at the second feature of Encore Mode, the Remixed Zones. Each stage in Encore Mode features a different color palette and a variety of minor level design changes. Sometimes they're as minor as changing the enemy and item box layouts, while other areas that used to be character exclusive feature retooled platforms and environmental design to accommodate for the four other playable characters. Since you may not have all the characters available to you at any given time in Encore Mode, the game has to assume you can't reach any exclusive pathways and make sure that every crucial route is accessible by every character. This ensures the character exclusive pathways still exist for minor secrets and goodies, but major paths are doable no matter which characters you have at the time. At its most extreme, Encore Mode actually features a brand new stage. Mirage Saloon Act 1 thankfully ditches the tornado section and instead has a standard stage created with all five characters' movesets in mind. While some mighty pathways have been retroactively added into Encore Mode's level layouts, Mirage Saloon Act 1 is the only place where they feel a bit more organic, since they were included from the very beginning instead of just being slapped into existing level geometry. This is easily the best part of Encore Mode, and I wish it had included some more exclusive content like this. Well, actually, maybe not in this instance, since I'd much rather play this Act 1 of Mirage Saloon than the Tornado level in Mania Mode. There are also a few other cool changes, like how you can pick which boss to do in Lava Reef Act 2. The original Sonic route to Heavy Rider is open at the same time as Knuckles' pathway to Heavy King, so you're allowed to pick your favorite regardless of which characters are in your party. I generally prefer to fight Heavy King, but Heavy Rider isn't a bad fight or anything like that. This is just a really neat option that shakes things up a bit more. And if we're talking color palettes... 
Green Hill looks gorgeous, I love the sunset. Chemical Plant looks alright with its blue undertones, and Studiopolis just looks ugly, as if it had all its colour and personality sucked away. I mean, talk about a downgrade. The brass look of Flying Battery is alright. Press Guard in Act 1 looks like someone vomited on the screen, and Act 2 is only a little better because of the blue background. The sunset skies of Stardust Speedway Act 1 are beautiful, but the zone's yellow look doesn't really sit well with me. Act 2's bad future, on the other hand, looks fantastic, or at least down on the lower levels where you can see the red lights in the background against the cyan foreground. The original palette still looks better overall, but this is a really fun change. Hydro City looks almost exactly the same, except a bit duller and greener. But Mirage Saloon looks lovely at nighttime with all of its blues and purples. The bright blue skies of Oil Ocean are a nice change, but it might be a little too bright. And Lava Reef Act 1 is just hotter and more red. Nothing much more to say on that one, but Act 2 is just kind of gross looking with its brown backgrounds and weird faded purples and greens. Metallic Madness looks really dull, also featuring a lot of brown, and Titanic Monarch's puke green look just does not mesh with the Eggman theme whatsoever. Also, the beautiful blue city background looks all gross and orange now, and I don't like it. So yeah, these are the changes to the zones in Encore mode. I'm pretty happy with the options in the level design, but some of the palettes rub me the wrong way. On top of all these smaller changes to zones, and the ability to switch characters, I actually think what is perhaps the biggest draw to Encore mode are its new set of special stages. Before touching on the stages themselves, most of their giant ring entrances have been completely relocated, which adds a much larger incentive for thorough exploration to Encore mode. I'm so used to Mania mode at this point that I can breeze through the original 7 special stages no problem, especially since I know all their giant ring locations. But in Encore mode, I've got to be on my toes a bit, so having access to all of the characters is definitely a plus, as I can freely switch between different movement options to find the rings more easily. Or I can just keep playing as Ray and glide everywhere, that works too. The new Emerald races of Encore mode set themselves apart from Mania mode in the sense that they're really damn hard. Hard enough that I didn't manage to get all of them on my first run of Encore mode without going back to Flying Battery Act 1 and grinding the last few over and over. Although part of that is also that I missed heaps of the new ring entrances on my first playthrough. The new special stages offer a much more intense layout, with bottomless pits and spikes everywhere. I think the biggest challenge comes with the timer, since the UFO spawns so far away in these stages, and maintaining control at Mach 3 to catch up with it can be really difficult. Now, in my original critique, I said these were my favourite Sonic special stages now, and I think I still stand by that. However, when it came time to record a new run of Encore mode, I began to really notice some of the problems with these stages. Some of them are artificial issues, like the low draw distance on the terrain, and perhaps more importantly, upcoming obstacles. While this may preserve the Sega Saturn look, it's just not fun to have to guess what's coming up when you literally cannot see it especially with moving rows of spikes that can pop in at the last second before you have time to jump over them. I also still do not enjoy the invisible wall barriers that prevent you from jumping over certain gaps. This became a big problem with the Encore stages, because they get so fast on such narrow terrain with really tight turns that I could just barely determine which parts I could jump over and which ones I couldn't. I also found some of the tighter platforming segments a little difficult to judge in terms of depth, sometimes causing me to miss jumps from just how strict the timing was. I don't so much have a problem with the strict platforming, but I have had a couple points where it really looked like I should have bounced off a bumper or landed on a platform, and instead completely missed and failed the stage. To be fair, I'm not entirely sure how to address elements of depth perception like that, but it's still an issue that I encountered and I wanted to mention it. In terms of the core design of these special stages, I think that overall I really do like them, since I appreciate the added challenge. My issues with course design is more surrounding how twisty they can be, sometimes becoming confusing to navigate at such high speeds, especially when there are forks in the road. The final special stage in particular looks like it has all of these potential shortcuts where the paths intersect, but are often blocked by invisible walls, making the intended path very hard to focus on. And I need to stress that the UFO gets such a head start in these races that you will be taking these laps over and over until you probably run out of time. Sometimes when the UFO is quite literally a few meters away from you. They can feel like marathons at points. Also, I found it odd how these new special stages technically incorporated one minor new element to the level design. Bumpers. 
Now, these are merely the ring or sphere boxes, except they don't give the player rewards, and don't disappear after being bounced on, but I find it very interesting how they created a somewhat new element to create levels with, but didn't really use it very much, let alone create any other new mechanics for these harder stages. I think mixing things up with some kind of new gimmick to the special stages could have really added a bit more personality to Encore mode as a whole. But, as it is, I still think that these new special stages are mostly pretty damn good. There's just some technical and design issues that are holding them back from being completely fair. And that about wraps up everything for Encore Mode. The narrative just makes things more confusing, the character switching is cool, but I'd probably be good with the standard system going forward in future games. The color palettes are hit or miss, the changes to existing zones, along with new content like Mirage Saloon Act 1, are pretty great. The new bonus stage is a good addition while still lacking compared to Sonic 3, but at least it carries over to Mania mode, and the harder special stages offer a true challenge to skilled players while sometimes sacrificing truly fair design. As a quick aside, I'd say the Encore DLC is totally worth it for Mighty and Ray, the new bonus stage, and the exclusive special stages and Mirage Saloon Act 1 from Encore mode, considering it's only 5 American dollars. As someone who already has almost 100 hours across Mania on Switch and Steam combined, the added content of Plus gives me even more reason to keep coming back. Although it is worth a reminder that many of the small changes to Mania mode are fixed in the free update regardless of if you've purchased the DLC. So if you're like me and only really play Mania mode but don't care about Mighty and Ray, then maybe you won't get as much out of it. There is still so much to love about Sonic Mania. I love the new zones, I love the old zones even though they make the game less unique and original, I love the music, the animations, the passion that oozes out of everything this game has. But there's also a lot of small things that could have been done way better if the development team had been given more time. At this point, all I'm waiting for is the announcement of some kind of Mania sequel, with a bigger budget to let the team work even longer on getting everything as perfect as possible. Either that, or a remake of Sonic 3 & Knuckles on Taxman's retro engine. Just not stuck on mobile devices this time, please. According to the official Sonic the Hedgehog social media accounts, Sonic Mania Plus is now the highest rated Sonic game in 25 years. Which I take to mean that in terms of general reception, everyone's in agreement with me that Mania is the best Sonic game since 3 & Knuckles. While I still think Sonic 3 does a lot better than Mania, there's also so much that Mania does better that the line is starting to blur between which game I truly enjoy playing more. I will always say that Sonic 3 & Knuckles is the better game, but it is lacking in accessibility and modern conveniences such as widescreen and a complete lack of performance issues. It's honestly been such a fun ride since Mania was originally announced, getting the game in my hands and then getting it literally in my hands with a physical copy a year later, and making these two critiques. This is a game that is very, very special to me, and I think it shows. Once I started getting into my mid-teens, I did really try to downplay the whole Sonic obsession thing, but I can't deny that when this guy gets good games, holy crap can they be good. And holy crap do I fall in love with them. If you want to stay posted with what I'm doing, there's my official Discord server where you can chat with me directly, or my Twitter where you can see me gushing about Super Smash Bros. and complaining about the upcoming live-action Sonic movie that was probably doomed from the start. Actually, speaking of Smash Bros. real quick, now that Nintendo's rules on monetization have changed, I may try and look into their games a little more going forward. No promises since my rate of creating videos is terrible already. Doing an animation degree takes a lot of my time. Thank you so much for watching this video, and thank you to the Mania development team for finally giving me another fantastic 2D Sonic game. Here's hoping there's even more to come.